Hello, I am Jason Parente. I am one of the physician assistants in the emergency department. Hi, I'm Christina Chang. I'm one of the physician assistants also in the emergency department. Hi, my name is Calvin Huang. I'm one of the physicians in the emergency department. We're part of the division of emergency ultrasound at Massachusetts General Hospital. Today we'll be talking about ultrasound guided peripheral IV access. We'll be discussing the relevant machine knowledge followed by the specifics of access, including the anatomy, the actual procedure, and advanced techniques and tips. What buttons will you need to know on the machine that you're using? Well, you're going to need to know where the power button is, uh, as well as the depth and the gain. This is a Sonocyte M-Turbo. The power button is here. Here's the depth and the gain. Probe selection. For most ultrasound-guided procedures, uh, you'll be using a linear probe. It's high frequency, so it lets you see um, structures at a better resolution, um, but it's a low depth of penetration, so you can't see very far into the tissue. For most procedures, the probe marker should be on your left, and also the screen marker should be on your left. We'll talk later about a short axis versus a long axis view. Linear probe. Let's talk about anatomy first. Everyone has several large veins, um, the cephalic vein that goes over the bicep, the basilic vein that runs on the inner arm, as well as the brachial vein, uh, which then splits into the two antecubital veins next to the brachial artery. Here it is in a cross-sectional view. You can see the cephalic vein, the basilic vein, and again, the antecubital arteries and veins. So what does a vein look like? So a vein is a hypoechoic structure, so that means it's black. Um, it's usually round and continuous as well as compressible. So here's an example of a vein that's being compressed. So how do we tell the difference between an artery and a vein? In general, we'll look for compressibility um, and also look for the arterial pulsation. You have to be careful, however, because it's possible to overcome the diastolic pressure of an artery and actually collapse it. Additionally, some vessels without clear pulsations that are non-compressible may represent a thrombosed vein. In this clip, there are four vessels. These three here are clearly compressible, uh, whereas the one in the center that's larger is both pulsatile and non-compressible. So in this clip, we see that there's one artery and three veins. So actually, I like to, um, instead of just pressing once to check for compressibility, I actually like to hold pressure and watch the screen to see what happens. You can see in this clip, pressure is being held, Two veins are being compressed, um, and you can see the clear pulsatility of the artery. In this clip, even more pressure is being held, um, and you can see that the diastolic uh, pressure is overcome, um, yet the systolic pressure lets the artery uh, still pulsate. So let's talk about the side marker in depth. So each machine will have a marker on the side that will let you know how far into the soft tissue the machine is looking. You can use these to approximate the distance um, between the surface or the skin uh, and the vessel. And this will let you or help you choose the appropriate length catheter. Also, it lets you pick an appropriate target because you can approximate the vein width. In this example here, the entire screen depth is two centimeters. Each hash mark is five millimeters. That means that the distance to the vein surface is probably about two millimeters. And the distance to the middle of the vein is probably about three to four millimeters. Let's talk about depth to the vein as well as catheter length. Um, for a vein that's about, you know, less than two millimeters, you might consider using a short catheter. Here at Mass General Hospital, our short catheters are 1.16 inches. In general, once veins get deeper than that, anything more than three millimeters, uh, I would recommend using a long catheter. Here we have 1.88 inch catheters. However, the really superficial veins should really be able to be seen uh, just on the surface of the skin. So whenever you're placing an ultrasound and gui guided IV, um, please use a long catheter, 1.88 inches. Uh, let's talk about the gauge catheter. So um, the difference between an 18 gauge and a 20 gauge catheter is only about 0.2 millimeters. I highly recommend using only an 18 gauge catheter because it's easier to see and will give you a better flow rate. Here's an example of a short 20 gauge catheter next to a long 20 gauge catheter. So let's talk about some ideal vein characteristics. Ideally, you'd like to target a vein that is about 3 millimeters to 10 millimeters below the surface. This is because veins that are more superficial than this actually become more difficult to cannulate because you can't redirect your needle. 
veins deeper than this are probably too deep to achieve an appropriate angle. You want to be targeting veins on the antecubital surface. And you always want to make sure that your vein follows a linear course and that there's no distal obstruction or otherwise change in direction of the vein. When you start, most people are concerned about veins that are too close to arteries, uh, so you should be conscious of that, although you might find that when you're more advanced, uh, it's easier to cannulate veins um, next to arteries because they're tethered in place. You want to avoid things like nerves and muscles because these can be quite painful if you hit one. And be conscious of things like scar tissue and fascial planes uh, that you may or may not visualize on the ultrasound. Okay, so now let's talk about the procedure. The first step is to position the machine. Ideally, you want to have the machine directly in your view, and this may include having it placed on the opposite side of the patient. Next, you'd like to make sure that you dress the probe. We usually recommend placing a tegaderm directly on top of the probe um, without gel underneath it and making sure there's no air bubbles. Then you can apply a tourniquet to your patient or sometimes two. And finally, you're going to want to identify your insertion site and sterilize it as you normally would. We recommend using Surgilube as your ultrasound gel at this point. So here you can see the arm being cleansed and then Surgilube being applied directly to the area. Next, you're ready for catheter placement. Place the probe with your non-dominant hand over the vein and obtain a short axis view. Once the vein is localized, you can insert the IV approximately one centimeter distal from the probe at an appropriate angle. You can then enter into the soft tissue and watch for a flash. Upon exertion, you should notice that the needle will appear hyperechoic and bright on the screen. It's very important to make sure that you can see the needle tip as you enter the tissue. You can notice the tissue moving around it, but this also allows you to direct a trajectory at real time. Upon hitting the vessel, you will also notice a tenting of that vein. Here is a video showing the short access technique. You will notice a needle coming down from the soft tissue surface and entering straight down into the vessel. There's tenting of the skin and the hyperechoic tip. Here is also in another example of the needle tip coming into the vessel. Once again, you can notice the hyperechoic tip right into the center of the vessel. Upon review of the short axis technique, this is considered a dynamic technique. Remember that the bevel tip always appears very different than the needle or IV shaft. There should be no poking or jiggling as, as this can cause unnecessary trauma to the soft tissue or surrounding structures. You wanna slowly advance the needle by small increments until the plane of the sound waves is crossed. Slide or fan the probe proximately and repeat until the vein is completely cannulated. This technique allows you to limit the likelihood of advancing the catheter through the posterior venous wall, which can cause extravasation. This is a video of the short access technique in real time. You'll notice the needle entering the soft tissue and the hyperechoic tip on the screen and the ability to change trajectory of that needle toward the targeted vein. You will also notice the tenting of the surface of the vein once the needle comes close and once it penetrates that vein you should notice a flash.
It is important to differentiate between the beveled tip, that's hyperechoic, as shown on the video on the left, from the IV shaft, which is shown on the video on the right. Once again, this is an illustration of the short axis technique in which you slowly move the probe in small increments, proximally, as you slowly advance the IV catheter toward the vein. As you do this, you're always keeping the bevel tip in view as to prevent any penetration into the posterior venous wall. Okay, so advanced technique number two. This is referred to as the long access approach. The advantage of this technique is that it allows you to visualize the entire length of the needle the entire time as well as the entire length of the vein. In that setting, you're less likely to puncture the posterior wall. A disadvantage would be that it's difficult to tell if you're at the edge of the wall, if you're too medial or lateral, and you might falsely believe that you're in the center of the vein. When doing this technique, it's important to insert the needle at the edge of the probe as opposed to having extra distance that you may use in the short axis technique. You can also switch between a short and long axis approach to make this a te uh, technique even more beneficial. So here's an example of a probe being placed in a short axis and then being moved to a long axis visualizing the entire In this clip, we're fanning from left to right across the vein, which you'll notice is on top of an artery. Here you can see the entire length of the needle, which is puncturing the vein and not going through the posterior wall. And finally, you can see the catheter being advanced into the vein as the needle is being withdrawn. Okay, next we'll go over some tips to help improve your success. Tip number one, it's very important to examine both arms um, to find the best vein for cannulation. You shouldn't spend more than 30 seconds per arm. Don't forget to put a tourniquet on first. Um, take the probe and quick, quickly sweep up the arm, looking for any obvious veins. Once you find a vein that you think might be suitable, then you can slow down and do a better or more detailed proximal and distal evaluation. Make sure that the vein doesn't dive too deep. Make sure there's no significant branching uh, or valves that might get in the way of your catheter. Sometimes it's also helpful at this point to switch into a long axis view to get a sense of the trajectory of the vein along the arm. In this clip here, you can see that this vein has two branches that join together, um, but then becomes kind of straight. The probe is switched into a long axis view, and then the operator is checking for compressibility. Tip number two, use lidocaine whenever possible. This is very important, especially when you're starting out, and I really can't emphasize this more. I generally use about one milliliter of 1% lidocaine with no epinephrine, um, and I usually use a TB or insulin syringe. These usually have a 27 or 29 gauge needle on the tip, about one centimeters long. Um, and again, when this is a non-emergent procedure, you know, if it doesn't have to be done in the next 30 seconds, this will definitely actually save you time in the long run. The main issues are that it really decreases patient factors. There's nothing more stressful than a patient who is really uncomfortable um, when you're first starting out um, and having that area numb to give you a little bit more time to adjust your needle and your trajectory is really helpful. Additionally, the lidocaine injection itself um, can act as a warning shot. When a small amount of lidocaine is injected just underneath the skin, hydrodissection occurs and you should be able to see a small amount of fluid accumulating on your screen. And so I do do this real time with the ultrasound probe before I put the actual IV in. If the bolus of fluid is off to the side, then you know that you're in the wrong spot. If the bolus of fluid is directly above the vein, um, then you know you're good to place your IV catheter in that same spot. Finally, uh, injecting lidocaine is actually almost like additional practice. Um, getting used to where the middle of the probe is um, and where a needle is on the screen um, kind of gives you two chances to practice for every one IV placement. Here you can see a small bolus of lidocaine being injected above the vein. The fluid appears hypoechoic or black and it's spreading out the soft tissue around it. 
Tip number three. So it's really important to not put too much pressure with the probe on the vessels. So I actually call this like the Dr. Evil technique because I actually use my pinky finger. Uh, I hold it up in the air and then I place my pinky finger back down on the patient so that the probe is barely touching the skin. Theoretically speaking, you can perform this without putting any pressure on the patient as long as there's a small, thin layer of gel. The main issue is that when you put any pressure down on the soft tissue, you can A, collapse small veins that would not have otherwise been visible, um, and also you, you can significantly change the depth from the skin surface to the vein. This, I think, is actually one of the main reasons why people have a hard time placing the IVs. When they're placing the actual the catheter, there's too much pressure. When they release, that soft tissue rebounds and actually pulls the tip of their needle out of the vein. Um, and then when the operator goes to thread, they're actually threading into the soft tissue. So really make sure that you don't put any pressure on the patient's skin with the probe. Tip number four. Okay, so you've made a little mistake and you've had an arterial cannulation. So the first thing is don't forget, if you have a 20 gauge IVN, that's no larger than a normal radial eight line. So don't forget to draw the labs and the culture that you need first, then withdraw the catheter and hold press. Tip number five. So what do you do when you can't advance your needle or you're having a really hard time? So don't blindly force or advance the needle or catheter, but also don't necessarily take out or withdraw the catheter. Use ultrasound. So pick up the probe, take a look, um, and sometimes you can see that the tip really is in the catheter. Maybe that there's a lot of scar tissue and you're just having a lot of resistance. So if you can see the tip of your catheter uh, after you've picked up that probe, then it might be okay to use a little bit more force to advance your IV. Sometimes uh, in this view when I'm having a hard time, I will switch to a longitudinal view, and this can be very helpful. Sometimes the catheter itself is getting hung up on the back wall, and in real time you can make a slight adjustment to allow your catheter to pass easily. Additionally, it's very important to flush to confirm placement afterwards, especially if the patient is going to be getting vasoactive medications or going to be sent for a CT scan with contrast. It is actually okay to flush one of these veins with a tourniquet when you're observing in real time. The reason why is because the veins that you should be hitting are actually much larger in diameter, and it's very difficult to blow these veins um, by injecting just a small amount of saline. In this video clip here, you can see a IV catheter sitting in a vein. Tip number six, cleaning. So gel is everywhere. Um, and be really uh, wary of dislodging your catheter by accident when you're cleaning up um, after you've uh, placed your line. So I actually recommend not using gauze to push the soft tissue or to clean away from yourself. A lot of times you can actually pull the soft tissue off of the catheter. I make sure I use my left hand to hold the catheter in place and I wipe away the gel mostly to the sides. You can lift the catheter up as long as you're being careful to clean underneath as well. Otherwise, your tegaderm won't stick to your site, it'll fall off, and then your access point will be dirty. Tip number seven. I really just wanted to reiterate confirm placement, especially in high-risk cases. An example again being someone going for a CT scan with IV contrast or someone receiving pressors. So it's really important to note that an 18 gauge catheter in a relatively large vein, so something, you know, three to four millimeters across, should really generate very brisk flow. If you're drawing labs off of your line, those tubes should be filling very quickly. Sometimes uh, when a patient is actually intubated or receiving high flow O2, the blood is, or the venous blood is actually brighter than normal. I've gotten nervous because the flow is so great. You've got now brisk flow and it's bright red. And the question is, is it uh, in the artery? But don't forget, you have the ultrasound probe next to you. Feel free to pick it up and take a look and make sure you're that, that you're in the vein and not the artery. Continuing on with tip number seven, don't forget you can always use other techniques to check. You can switch to a longitudinal view. You should be able to see the catheter in the vein. Don't forget it's okay to flush um, with the tourniquet on in a larger vein only, and also use Doppler when you're not sure. This is an example of an IV catheter in a vein, and you can see an artery right below it. And this is actually the same case now with a flush using color Doppler. 
you can see that there's color flow in the venous system. And again, you can see the IV catheter sitting in the vein. In summary, vein selection is very important. Make sure that you pick a vessel that is of appropriate depth, so something not too deep, yet also not too superficial, so that you have some soft tissue distance to redirect your needle in real time. Please choose a vein of a good diameter, ideally something 5 millimeters or larger. Be cognizant of surrounding structures, such as arteries, nerves, fascial planes, and scar tissue. When trying to determine if a vessel is an artery or a vein, don't forget to hold gentle compression and watch to see what happens. You can also use color Doppler to confirm that you're not about to cannulate an artery. Please, please use a long catheter, 1.88 inches in length. Don't forget to always use a sterile technique. Cover the probe surface with a tegoderm, clean the skin with alcohol or chlorohex, and use surgilube. Don't forget to always confirm placement, especially in lines that are about to receive intravenous contrast or pressors. And finally, don't forget to document your procedure in EPIC. Thank you very much.